I knew a bit about George III because I did history at university. And I knew what's called the Regency Crisis when he, when he first be, showed symptoms of mental illness and how, although he had attacks later on, this first one was relatively short. In a sense, it was a gift to a dramatist because it had a beginning, a middle and an end. It's good for me personally because I'm not good on plots and, and the, the, the whole plot was there. I'm not one of your Lincolnshire lunatics. I am urban, metropolitan, and royal, and not to be... It's a wonderful play and a, obviously a brilliant part. Alan has been a huge influence on me since my childhood, and I particularly like this play's combination of his voice and the historical record and this very human story. <laughs> Here we are at the Royal Library. And what we've done here is we've set out a selection of documents relating to George III uh, to show you. And all of these are the originals. Wow. A little bit about yes. George's illness and perhaps also talk a little bit about him as a man. Because, uh, Wonderful. Do you know, he's a complicated uh, character. It just makes the whole thing suddenly very vivid and very real. What I think is very striking in looking at these documents, we've so often come across phrases that you can hear echoing in the play. He ends up this side and he ends up this side. And at the time, it was thought that he was mad, but they couldn't work out why. Later on, people started to put it down to porphyria um, because of the fact that the king's urine was blue. In recent times, much more seen as some kind of nervous breakdown. There's a theory that George, as a young man, was quite a spontaneous person. And when he was being tutored in order to become the monarch, they taught him how to be much more disciplined and rigid. And so now it's thought that perhaps the mental breakdown came on from years of repression. Fetch the waistcoat. Fetch it. No. This is a striking one as well. A matter of fact, a account of the, the, the worst manifestations of the treatment. During the night, night he, he became restless, restless and turbulent, jumped up from his bed and in other respects was much unsettled. About five o'clock in the morning, His Majesty became so ungovernable that recourse was had to the straight waistcoat, yes. my favourite. His legs were tied and he was secured down across his breast and in this melancholy situation he was when I came to make my morning inquiries. <laughs> Monarchy, by its very nature, is theatrical. The royals are giving a performance. It's all the trappings of theatre. Music, costume, props, staging. We're in the foyer of Nottingham Playhouse. It's the theatre that I first came to as a child in the 1980s to see pantomime. It's a quite a big auditorium. It seats 770 people when we get all the seats in. Nottingham Playhouse is a producing house, which means that we make much of the work ourselves in the actual theatre. We still have production departments, and not many theatres have those nowadays. So we have a costume department, a props department, a set building department, and highly skilled workers who do all that work. So some of the George III cloth is one that's based on a Canaletto painting, which helps locate the action in St Paul's. And the production also begins with a painted front cloth rather than one made of fabric, uh, which echoes the Regency period that the play's set in. We're now down in the props department. I love this room. It's always something fun to see. The rats are from pantomime. I think the severed head is based on one of our actors, and that was from Revenge's Tragedy the other year. George III is a big show for us. It's a large cast. There's multiple scenes, way more scenes than your average play. Uh, thank you, Alan Bennett. Um, it's not unlike a Shakespeare play. One minute you're in a big court scene with a massive ensemble, and the next minute you've shrunk to a much more intimate, domestic two-hander. Have you nothing to say to me, sir? Say, madam, what is there to say? You have been married for 28 years, 
never separated even for a day, then you abandon me to my tormentors. Ingratitude! That is what I say. It's a man's world, for sure. Your position is about who you are married to. I think the Queen, she's quite spiky. Uh, she doesn't really care what people think of her, which I think is, is what has enabled her to survive so long in that world. And she has a few close friends. And I think within the world of the play, you are her only friend, mm. really. She's first lady of the bedchamber, mm. which is an exceptionally privileged role. They're both warm and they solve many of the problems. They sort of facilitate us, mm. but also they just have emotional intelligence. They're in bed then. And she's had 15, 15 kids. children. 15. She has got to be so physically. She's small but mighty. Oh my goodness, she must be so physically strong. This one is, is back to the Queen, Queen Charlotte. And, and we just put this one because it's, it's, it's a perfectly ordinary letter. Yeah. And it's a letter from the Queen to the King. So it begins, Sir. But then once you get past the Sir, we move there into... There never was anybody so agreeably surprised as I have been an hour ago by the arrival of Your Majesty's letter. And I look forward with great impatience for Wednesday evening to embrace and congratulate Your Majesty upon your return amongst us. It's a colloquial letter, but with the words His Majesty, Your Majesty, <laughs> when you'd put George, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Oh, lovely. There's a lovely sign-off as well. Your Majesty's most affectionate and attached wife, Charles. George, there is a bill prepared to make the sun regent. Do you understand me? To rule in your place? Regent. <laughs> the fat one. No, no, no. This cannot be. That term, the world turned upside down, is a very resonant thing. And it, it obviously happens periodically. There is stability and then empires crumble. And suddenly everything's to play for. The opposition who thought they didn't have a chance are, are crouched in the rafters, ready to pounce. The Prince of Wales is ravenous to be king. Everything's about to change. When I rotate, which would be in 1990, the obvious parallel would be in the Prince of Wales. I think he says, being Prince of Wales is no occupation for a gentleman. Uh, and that's very true of Prince Charles. I mean, it was true of him in 1990, it's true of him today. No, oh, no. no, George. Someone very recently described the play as a perfect metaphor for Brexit. Brexit is our national uh, nervous breakdown, and the king is embodying the state. It's like that moment a couple of years ago before the referendum when there was, there was one week when there was too much news. It was, it was astonishing. My head was spinning. Every single day there was something else. And just go, please, stop this. Yeah, 